to put my talk in the philosophy uh, in the um, philosophical context, uh, I would like to say that uh, this relates to an old uh, Whitehead problem, uh, which is uh, about founding geometry of some uh, regions that can be, let's say, easily interpretable in the surrounding world, and. Uh, in one, uh, in one part of the process and reality, Whitehead writes explicitly that it may be possible to found, uh, to found geometry maybe upon the notion of oval or ovate class, as he calls it. So, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, my collaborator, uh, Gian Giacomo Gerla, we thought that uh, it may be a good idea to follow this Whitehead idea and to try to build geometry or some system of geometry taking the notion of oval as a primitive notion, as one of the primitive notions. And luckily we discovered that uh, in the 60s of the 20th century uh, Polish mathematician Aleksander Sznatycki uh, constructed a system of affine geometry uh, in which he used as primitives the notions of region, the notion of parthood and the notion of half plane. So, our idea was the following: knowing that, uh, knowing that he did it, knowing that he managed to reconstruct the fine geometry by means of the notion of half plane, we thought that we may take we may take on the following strategy. We will start with the notion of oval, and we will try to define the notion of half plane by means of the notion of an oval region. And then we'll try to find intuitive axioms put upon ovals. And finally, we'll try to show that with these axioms, we are able to prove Shantitsky's axioms for half planes. And thanks to this, we will be able to show that at least a fine geometry can be reconstructed by means of these uh, regions that Y had called ovals. If you wonder what an oval is, Think of, a, of an oval like a paradigmatic example of an oval, an epitome of an oval as a convex region in Euclidean plane, yes? So this is, kind, this is what we have in mind by thinking about oval. It doesn't have to be bounded. So for example, if you took it to be the plane, this would be an oval for us as well, yes? There is, okay. Mm. I'll try to use this and this. Okay. So let me try with this one. Okay. So this would be an oval for us as well, yes? So we are not limiting ourselves to... Okay. So first, this is, this is the... The first part of the presentation is the presentation of Shantitsky's result. And the... I would, I would like to focus rather on spatial and combinatorial ideas behind his, behind his constructions in, instead of talking about, uh, instead of talking about uh, just uh, formulas and axioms. Uh, I would like to focus on intuitions. So if you, you know well what a fine geometry is, just let me remind it that it, from one perspective it may be treated this portion of uh, it with me. What remains of Euclidean geometry when you, when you only have betweenness? but you do not have any metric notion. Yeah? Or you may look upon it as a, a study of lines and parallelity of lines, yes? as a fine geometry. So for example, the Playfers, Playfers axiom, the famous version of Euclidean axiom, which says that where you have a point beyond the line, there is only one parallel line to the other, is one of the axioms of a fine geometry, for example. So it was the idea. So, Looking upon this idea from mathematical perspective and logical perspective, we focused, uh, Schnatetsky focused on triples of the following form, where the underlying structure is Boolean algebra. And for the uh, sake of my talk, I do not actually have to assume anything else except for the fact that this is a Boolean algebra. To prove some axioms, you need atomless, uh, atomlessness and uh, completeness, but it will be rather uh, it will be relevant in one point. So. And uh, we take a distinguished subset, the set of half planes, and neither one nor zero is a half plane. So the aim is to reconstruct the notion of line, of point, of incidence relation, and of betweenness relation. So those the, the notions which are basic notions of a fine geometry. Okay, 
So the first axiom, the pretty obvious, these are all Schnatetsky's axioms, these are not our axioms. This pretty obvious axiom is the one which says that if something is a half plane, then the Boolean complement must be a half plane too. Yes? So this is, the first, uh, this is the first simple axiom, so this is the Boolean complement. And I will also use two auxiliary formulas to familiar, uh, auxiliary notions to facilitate my presentation and to simplify formulas. I will use the notion of Boolean overlapping in terms that two regions overlap if and only if their product is non-zero. And incompatibility relation, which I define simply as having no uh, non-zero common part. So the first axiom is that a complement of half, the complement of half plane is a half plane. So the second axiom is pretty complicated. I just put it here for completeness reasons, but you may think about it like that. That this is axiom which says something like that. If you have three regions, then you can always have two possibilities. Either the configuration is like that, then you can always find three half planes separating them. So, of course, this is, this is I put in axioms, but I would like to, to have in mind the standard model. So think about the standard model, the Euclidean planes, uh, the Euclidean two-dimensional plane, as a kind of a litmus paper or testing of my, my, my axioms or intuitions for the axioms. So this says something like that. There are two possibilities for any three regions. Either they are separated by, by half planes, or otherwise you will always find, you will always, always find a half plane which goes through three of them, yes? Which means going through, going through, what does it mean the half plane goes through a region? It means that the region overlap, let's say this is the region A, which simply means that region overlap H and the region overlap the complement of H, yes? So this is the idea. So this axiom says you can always, having three regions, Either they are separated by half planes or there is a half plane which cuts them free. So now a line, in an obvious way, a line can be, can be defined as a set which consists of a half plane and its complement. Yes, this is a line. This is some primordial, some intuition what a line is. And of course, we can define now what does it mean that lines are parallel. So they are parallel in case they do not intersect. Yes, this is the standard idea. So if you find at these joint sides of a plane, they must be parallel. Otherwise, we say they're non-parallel and they intersect. So, uh, I will give you some examples in a minute, just please be patient. So if we have two intersecting lines, then we define the notion of an angle, which in case of intersecting lines, an angle is any of the four areas. This is an angle. Yeah? Any one of it, you've got four angles here. And we say that an angle is an opposite to another if it is a, exactly this, this, this configuration. So if you have a region that is a product of two half planes, then opposite region is the product which is the, we, the opposite region is a region which is the product of the complements of these half planes. So for example, these here and this here are opposite regions, uh, opposite angles. And a bow tie, the name I think is pretty suggestive, is the sum of two opposite angles. Yeah? And uh, uh, please also notice, this is quite important, that if you have two non-parallel lines, they determine four non-zero regions, that is four angles. So okay, some, uh, some spatial intuitions in a minute. And if you have parallel, the distinct uh, lines, we will, I will also use the, no the notion of a stripe, which is the common part of two parallel lines. So here are the intuitions. The first intuition is a bow tie, which, compo which is composed of two opposite angles. The second is a stripe, which is the product of the complement of H1 and H2. And the last one is the complement of a stripe. Yes? So what remains when you take out the inside of them. Okay. So uh, the third axiom, the third axiom is strictly related to uh, the paral parallelity of lines and the transitivity of the parallelity relation because it simply says that if any two subplanes of a half plane are, if you take any two half planes within a half plane, then they must be comparable in terms of part of relation. Yes. 
Why we need this? But for example, if you take the classical example of a Beltrami Klein model, there are lines, there are lines, half planes, H2 and H1. They are part of H, but they are incomparable in terms of part of relation, yes? Because the space is small in a way in Beltrami Klein's model. So we can so to exclude this, to exclude this, to assure that the parallelity will go through, Schnadetsky took these axioms. And the, the fourth axiom, which is pretty, uh, which is possibly the most complicated, not syntactically, but conceptually, is the axiom which says something like that. If you take the, the axioms which, I, I will, instead of focusing on formulas, I will try to, com uh, I will try to give you the idea. It says basically something like that, that a bow tie cannot be a part of a half plane. So you cannot put a bow tie into a half plane. So the situation H3 is excluded. You won't find something like that. And as well, the complement of, of a stripe cannot be included in a half plane as well, in this way. And it says in a way that there are no surprises in your space. So what does this mean? It means that if you take an angle and if you put it inside a bow tie, it must be in one part of this, yeah? either on the left, on the right, or so. So, for example, you've got a you've got a bow tie. Let's say you focus on this and this. So, it, there will not happen something like that, for example, yeah. Something which could surprise you. Yeah? This it will not it will not go oh, like that, for example. You do not have any pathological angles in your in your. Uh, Okay, now, what is a net? A net is determined by, uh, by um, uh, a set of lines, is the set of all non-zero regions. Yes, so all the all non-zero regions which are, uh, which are mm, determined by the set of planes is a, uh, is a net. So basically, think of a, you've got a set of half planes and you take all the, all the products, yes? which gives you non-zero results. And then you can say that uh, a net splits a region simply like here. You've got this situation. There are two lines, they are non-parallel, and they split the region into four parts. Because what is a net? A net consists of all non-zero regions. So this is a net. If you, if you take, for example, three half planes. What is a net? A net consists of this region, this region, this, this. So we've got seven regions, yes? And for example, if you put a region here, this net also divides it into four parts because it doesn't overlap. All of them doesn't overlap uh, this end. So why this? We'll need to reconstruct the notion of, to reconstruct the notion of point, we will need the notion of an H sequence, and H sequence is simply uh, and any element of the Cartesian products of the finite number of lines, and you take this H sequence to be positive, if and only if the product is non-zero, and you say that two sequences are opposite if they're opposite, they have opposite half planes on corresponding projections, yes? So this is the opposite. And uh, given a net, regions, X and Y, are opposite if there are positive, opposite edge sequences such that X is a product of the one sequence and Y is the product of the other sequence. Yes? So it may all be, uh, it may all sound a little bit complicated, but let me, ex let me explain you as well what's going on in here. But now, what, what's the idea? You define a pseudo point. A pseudo point is simply a pair of non-parallel of non-parallel half planes. Yes, this is a pseudo point. Of course, why it is not a point? Because you have at least you may have many candidates for this point. Yeah, for example, sorry, this is everything cuts here. So this is also a candidate of this location of space. Yes. So you must find a way to identify those pseudo points and take an equivalence class as a point in the space. So. And uh, if we have two pseudo points, we will call the lines which compose them determinants, 
And in case we have two pseudo points L1 and L2, we can say that they share a determinant <coughs> if uh, they share a determinant L1. Yes? So they have one line in common. So it will be something like that, nothing complicated. Look here. So if you have this pseudo point and this one, they simply share one determinant. Yes? There is something, they have something in common. Okay. So, what does it mean? The, we need the notion of a tied lines. The lines are tied if this is ternary relation. Three lines are tied if the Cartesian product of those three lines contains two different non-positive opposite edge sequences. And look for the examples. We've got three non-parallel lines. You've got only, there are seven there are seven positive H there are seven positive regions, so there is only one non-positive, so they are not tied because you need at least two non-zero and opposite uh, regions inside uh, inside um, this net. Yes. For example, look here. We've got six regions that are mined in this net. Two, if you compute it, two are non-positive, but they are not opposite. Yeah? The problem is that they are not opposite because they agree on this. There is only one, one, uh, there is only, uh, one projection upon which we have got a half plane and the complement of a half plane. So this is finally the positive example. What does it mean that, uh, that lines are tied? It means that Figuratively speaking, because you have no points, they meet in a location in space, one location in space, yes? So why, and here you've got two non-positive sequences, uh, sorry, two non-positive regions, and they are really, they are really H sequences, and uh, these non-positive H sequences are really opposite to each other. This is H1, the complement, the complement H2, H2, H3, the complement H3, yes? What's the idea? The idea is that how to grasp this idea click quickly, let me explain it because I would like to be understood. If you have, if you have this situation, yes? So these are opposite regions, let me say like that, minus, plus, plus, minus. These are opposite. So if you cut it like that, you will add one half plane to the product. So if you add, this will be, let's say, H3, the complement H3. So if here you have H1, the complement H2, and here you have the complement H1, H2, so you take the product of this and you take the product of this, they must be opposite. Yeah? These are opposite and you add opposite projections in a way from these lines. So this combinatorial explanation, this is the combinatorial explanation, what does it mean? The lines are tied because, of course, you cannot say tied because they, had, they share a pseudo point, yeah? because there is nothing like the, uh, you, you, they share a point, sorry, because you do not have points still. So we can now define, we can show that this is equivalence creation and we can take it to be points, the equivalence classes of this relation of being collocated, yes? Uh, okay. So now um, we can explain incidence relation. So you've got points, you've got points. So you can explain easily incidence relation in set theoretical terms. And uh, we can say, of course, that uh, the, lies, the line is in a half, what does it mean that point, point is in a half plane? Uh, of course, if you, have a, if you have a half plane H like here, and you would like to say something that a given point lies here. What does it mean? It means that if you t that there is some representative of this point such that all four regions have non-zero intersections with H. Yes? So it must be here. For example, if you take a point here, yeah, there are only three non-zero intersections. So it is not in the half plane. So why this? Now we can say, what does it mean that the line, lines between points alpha and beta, if and only if alpha lies in H and beta lies, lies 
in uh, the complement uh, the complement of H. So this is the explanation of betweenness coming here. So now we can define collinearity. There is some pseudo point from respect to the alpha and beta, and they share a determinant L. Yes. So this is what I explained with sharing a determinant. You can say the three points are collinear if you find a determinant going through common, uh, going through three pseudo points from respective points. Okay. Now. We can define uh, we can define betweenness relation. How much time do I have about? Okay, so we can define betweenness relation in this way, and then I will uh, skip it shortly because I would like to also tell you something about ovals, and we can uh, just in this structure satisfying these axioms, we can prove actually Schnatitsky could prove that he can uh, reconstruct the fine geometry. So he laid out this, uh, the system of axioms for a fine geometry and he proved all these axioms in, the, in his system. Yeah? So the, the, the main theorem of Schnatitsky would be like that, that individual notions of point and line and relational notion of incidence and betweenness are definable in such a way that the corresponding structure satisfies all axioms of a system of a fine geometry. Yeah? Okay, so now oval structures. So let me say something about our work. So we, we, we replaced the notion of a half plane with the notion of oval. And uh, what we did was we take the following axioms. We took the one to be an oval, and we took uh, to be the set of ovals closed under arbitrary infima. So this is where you need completeness. So it explains the, it, it's simply, speaking algebraically, the first axiom says that the class of ovals is the closure system, but speaking Intuitively, it says that you, uh, mm, it says that any intersection of ovals you take, it will always be a novel, yeah? whether finite or infinite. It doesn't matter. So this is the, this is the axiom. And now, of course, we can have uh, the operation of a uh, object uh, of the hull of the region X, yes, which will be the intersection of all the uh, ovals which are parts of A. So it means simply we take an oval hull of a region which is generated by X. So this is the first axiom, that, ovals, that the set of ovals is a um, closure system. And the second axiom was guaranteed denseness. So it says simply that uh, ovals are in every part of the space. And uh, we defined half plane. We define the half plane in the following way, that we distinguished among ovals uh, the set of all half planes, which is this part of the set of ovals, which is closed under complement. Yes? So the idea would be, for example, that, of course, this is not an oval. This is not a half plane, because the complement is not an oval. But this is a half plane, because the complement is an oval. Yes? Of course, the axiom says nothing about the existence of half planes. So let me look for it from geometrical perspective. We can also, now we can define the, what, what is the line. The line, again, is the same. This is a pair of complementary ovals. Yes? So this is the pair of half planes. But remember, it changed the notion of half plane. It is no longer primitive. It is defined as, the pair, as a pair of complementary ovals. Yes? So we can as well say, what is a line? A line is a pair of ovals which are half planes and which are maximal with respect to the Cartesian relation upon uh, projections. Yes? So this is, these are the biggest, the biggest parts, the biggest parts of, um, of ovals. What does, it mean? what does it mean? Look here. Uh, and of course, we again may define parallelity. We may define the parallelity in the following sense. The two lines are parallel if they have these joint sides. Yes? And otherwise, we can say that they intersect. So look at, the, look at the following example. It is a kind of a generalization of Beltrami Klein model. You've got the whole structure consists of three spheres. Take them as spheres in R2, and these are disjoint unions in a way. Yes? So we've got a, you've got a space consisting of these three spheres. For example, what can we say about it? This is a line, yes, this is a line, this is because you've got two, uh, this, it consists of two half planes in this part. This is a line, 
and here you've got a plenty of lines because you take just lines to be uh, restrictions of lines to these small disks. Now look, this satisfy our axioms. Now, uh, as I told you, we take we take the set of lines to consist of sets which coincide with which is our intersections with ordinary half planes from Euclidean plane. But, uh, for example, if you take the if you take the structure restricted to B one, so do not your structure is not B three but just B one. You exclude this one. So, for example, the side of this line, both are half planes. Actually, the sides of every line are half planes. Yes. But if you expand your structure, and now if we look upon the structure which consists of two separate spheres, okay, this is still a line. This is still a line. But for example, these are not half planes, yes? Why? Because these are complementary ovals, but the complement of I is B plus B2, yeah? And for example, the only half place in this structure are these and these, yes? And there is only one line in this structure which consists of half planes, and this is the line which is actually parallel to every other line if you're in your structure, yes? So which shows that we need simply another axioms, that we uh, need other axioms. For example, if you take at least three, if at least three spheres, there will be no half planes, yeah? And there will be and there will be no lines whose sides are, uh, whose sides, sorry, are half planes. So we needed, we needed axioms to exclude such, such uh, uh, let's say, non-Euclidean non -Euclidean models in the sense, uh, maybe not, not, not Euclidean, uh, but unwanted structures. So we simply put an axiom that uh, the line form a partition of the unity or that the sides of a line are really half planes, yes? So this was our third specific axiom. And our fourth specific axiom was that for any three uh, ovals which are not aligned, you can always find a line, a line which separates uh, it from the sum of the other two. So if you have three like that, and you take an oval generated by these two, you can always find a half plane which, divide, which separates them. And the fifth axiom was the following, that if you take two non-intersecting half planes, and there can, there can only be two situations. They can only split, if they both cross some oval, they can only split it either in three or four parts. There are no other possibilities, yes? So this is the fifth axiom, uh, the fifth axiom. And the sixth axiom was that no half plane is part of a stripe of an angle. So it was a little bit similar to uh, Leshnatetsky's axiom that you cannot put a half plane inside, <coughs> inside a stripe or an angle. And with this, we were able, let me call the O structure something like this, and with this, we were able to prove the following two theorems. Uh, which basically says that if you take our oval structure, if you define the notion of half plane, you enrich those structure with the notion of half plane, and if you take our axioms, put them on the ovals, then you can prove all Schnatitsky's half plane axioms, and thanks to this, you can reconstruct Euclidean, uh, sorry, a fine geometry in our system, yes? So as I told you, thanks to Schnatitsky, we were able to achieve this. So this partially answered the question answers the problem of uh, Whitehead, whether we can find found any geometry upon the notion of oval. So our answer is that this is this fragment of geometry which we normally call a fine geometry. And last, I would like to tell you that it is also possible to build Euclidean geometry, which is due to Tarski, and later with some improvements, but this is at a cost of taken another primitive, which is the sphere, by taking the as a primitive the, the, the sphere, and by uh, defining in this context. So the, the difference between uh, the previous approach and this approach is that you do not take half planes or neither half planes nor ovals, but you take spheres. With some complicated 
with some complicated definitions, you are able to define, uh, to define the con concentricity relation. So you are perfectly entitled to take points to be the set of concentric balls or spheres, whatever you prefer. Thanks to this, you can define equidistance relation. You can think about equidistance in the following way. The two points are equidistance from the third one. If you find a sphere inside a point such that the other ones, which are in respectively a point from A or from, uh, from point from alpha or point from beta, are fringe points of the, the sphere C. And actually this equidistance notion, the ternary equidistance notion, thanks to Pieri, we know that it satisfies all the axioms of Euclidean geometry, the system. You can reconstruct the system. You can axiomatize. This would be the proper way to put it. You can axiomatize the system of Euclidean geometry by means of this ternary notion. So we can say that having the notion of a sphere as a, as a primitive one, plus some extra concepts, we can actually uh, reconstruct Euclidean geometry. Why is it important in this context? Because you can really look upon sphere as a very special subclass of the class of all ovals. Yes? You may say that in a way this, these are most perfect ovals in your most idealized ovals in your domain of discourse. Uh, but this is Tarski's result is about 30s of the previous century. Thank you very much. This is what I want. To